That was your cue. You were supposed to sing the mailbag song. It's a mail, mailbag. <laughs> I'm a mailbag. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a. Welcome to your Sunday edition of Collider Mailbag. We will not keep that song, but I hope you enjoyed it for this episode only. <laughs> I'm Perry Nemroff. This is Jeff Snyder. Hi. Jeff, how you doing? I'm good. Yeah, I can tell. Ready for the weekend? Yeah. Yeah, well, we're, we're in it the thick the of weekend. it right now. It's the I, weekend. I'm ready for some fantasy football this evening. Oh. Yeah, because it's Sunday. It's Sunday. Oh. I don't know what's going on. I don't know. <laughs> what day am I supposed to be pretending that it is for this show? It's Sunday. But even though we're not recording this on a Sunday, whatever day it is now, I'm still looking forward to fantasy football because, as you all know, you've turned me into a monster. Yes, that's right. We've, have, we have I all have created a, major a monster problem. here in, in Perry. <laughs> um, just to remind you guys, as I always do, these questions for Mailbag come from three places. Instagram, Twitter, using the hashtag Collider Mailbag, and, of course, via email, mailbag at collider.com what else do i have to tell you oh this is a podcast too you could watch it in video form on the main collider youtube channel and you could also get the audio version on the collider movie talk feed so check that out share it tell everybody you know that would be nice all right ready to jump into our questions let's get it on question number one is an email question from sophia r who writes Hi, Collider crew. So award season is getting closer and closer. And besides from the Oscar, different parts of the industry have their own awards, like the actors with SAG, the producers, the PGA, the directors, DGA, and so on. If you could create a new award ceremony, how would you call it? And what awards will you be giving? Well, uh, first of all, I think that Collider should have an award show. I think we could actually get some celebrities up here in the studio. We could have Mark Ellis host it. I think Collider should be having its own award show. However. Wait, wait so what would the rules of that award show be? Just like as in best of the year, best performance Yeah, and all I that? think it could be similar to the Oscars. But I, well, it can be sort of what I'm about to uh, describe here because okay. I'm not, I, that's not my answer to the question. Because I know I don't want to get in a room with any of you and vote again because everybody's crazy and has crazy <laughs> opinions. So I, I would just do my own awards, Perry. I would call them the In Snyder Awards, and it would be a mixture of traditional categories that you'd find at the Oscars and those that you'd find at the MTV Movie Awards, which does things like Best Fight, Best Villain, On-Screen Duo, Breakout Awards, etc. But I might draw the line at Best Kiss. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, se- the, second you, the second you include best kiss, right? Delegitimize. It's a completely different kind show. of award show. Actually, as you were saying that, I feel like the In Snyder Awards should actually be. Like, it should be awards for, for agents and managers and all your contacts oh, that boy. you work with. <laughs> no? Would that, would that be Nobody's dangerous? getting an award this year. <laughs> Nobody. Dangerous territory. Um, so, of course, we know about, you know, SAG, PGA, DGA, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, all the branches of the Academy basically have their own awards. So you can look up a whole bunch of different ceremonies if you're interested in some of the other categories. But... I think that if I could make my own award show, the thing that I would be interested in celebrating the most is a new talent award show, where it was basically just I love that idea. either, not even necessarily first time features, but you know, someone who scored their first major uh, starring role in a movie or something like that, because I mean, we're constantly talking about that too. It's, you know, we're gonna hit another question. It's the title question, so I'm not really spoiling anything, but it's like when I think about who should play Wolverine, there's so many up and comers out there there and it's like I'm constantly googling new lists and trying to get my friends opinions and we just need I to love be this talking idea. Let's about do this it, more. Perry. Let's create the show. I am down to put in the work with you. You definitely win this round on the question. Your answer is definitely better. Okay. I love doing up and comer of the month because yeah. I'm sick of interviewing. That didn't even cross my mind until you just brought it up. But yeah, yeah you need you guys need to check out up and comer of the month on collider.com if you're not because that's that's basically it's much that better was my talking answer to young now. people who haven't been media trained to death or and haven't been doing press for 20 years like you know obviously it's cool to get an interview with those a-listers and i wish i got more of them and and i'm jealous of of you and frosty who get to do those but uh i like talking to the young people i can understand that i can understand that but on the flip side every so often it's really nice when you get into a room with like a really seasoned actor who's done a million different interviews but you get them for that special project where all of a sudden you see that that kind of like light in their eyes again and it's it's an unforgettable chat i want to do something called collider legends where we just interview like old people who could pass you know a- a- any day technically i think um, well <laughs> that's that's a, a morbid way to look at it but i think that both ideas some the, of these the older, the old we, have, we, we don't know how long we have with, with some of these guys at, or or women and i'd like to uh you know get them on camera get them in print i would be interested you know? in that too because it's 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 just they go so long between like big projects that they get pressed for i feel mm-hmm. like you know we're, we're letting some of their stories 
die with them because not enough media is paying attention to them. No, that's that's totally true. But anyways, I like your idea. Cool. We're going to make Boom. it happen. <laughs> okay. Question number two. Question number two. Wow. Instagram, Angelo Vantarakis. Mm, not bad. Good job. Angelo Vantarakis writes, with the Disney and Fox deal set to be done sooner than expected, who is your ideal actor to take up the Wolverine mantle? So, yeah, we already touched on this a little bit. Also, uh, Riley and Roka shared their picks recently. So just to recap that, they they were recommending Ben Foster, Taylor Kitsch, Tom Hardy, and Roka also threw out Daphne Keene. And... If there's any way where the continuity and the, the canon would make sense, I wouldn't mind seeing Daphne Keene kind of take up that mantle without necessarily being Logan. But um, Foster and Kitch are good ideas too. Hardy, I think it's one too many characters yeah, at this point. Yeah, you can't I don't just keep going. To Tom I Hardy. wouldn't want Tom Hardy, but you know uh, Taylor Kitsch and Foster. Ben Foster are are solid ideas okay. to me. Okay, but I like it. Ultimately, if I had my choice, we already have an MCU filled with famous faces, and I would want to see some up and comer get this opportunity which could be a game changer for someone's career but if I had to pick from some more familiar faces I think one of my favorite names that I've seen circulating is Aaron Taylor Johnson who I think kind of got a a little uh I guess cut short with his Quicksilver role and I think he's great we've seen him we've seen him just show off his extreme range in so many different projects so I think that he could probably embody Logan slash Wolverine pretty well like it? Yeah. The the other one that I have. Uh, Throw them out there. Give them, give them all to me. All right. So I, I recently was doing some uh, some fan casting for Batman. And two of the names that are exciting me just because I think they're great and they're not household names yet are Jonathan Tucker and Jack Rayner. I just want to see them get more opportunities. But in thinking about Wolverine specifically, the other thing that came to mind and really excited me was Daniel Kaluuya. Because you saw Widows, right? Yeah, he's terrifying Dude is in that. scary in Widows. He's super sweet in something like Get Out, where he is someone you can get behind and root for, and then he's so freaking malicious and scary in Widows. So I think the combination of those two things could work pretty well for Wolverine. You came to play today, I did, Perry. I did. You really did. Damn, I like both those choices. Jonathan Tucker is an actor I've liked since he was in Sleepers as, as a like little boy. Do you like the Ruins, too? Because I'm I like, obsessed yeah, with the Yeah, I do like the Ruins. I like the Ruins, and he's on... He was on Kingdom, so yeah, like he's, yeah. he could, he's got the he physique. Up there, yeah. Jack Rayner, I could I could also see if he, uh, you know, sort of just like, mm, I could I could see it. I like all those names. Damn. Okay. I feel like you got some good names too. I have a few. I don't yeah? know. Yeah. Oh no, now you're not uh, excited about them anymore. All right. So like, I, I first of all, I did some research on Wolverine because like okay. in my I don't read the I didn't read the comics. I, I yeah, know yeah. what Wolverine looks like, but. You know, to me, Hugh Jackman is Wolverine. So are we looking to for the same kind of guy, like, or somebody completely different? You know, to make the role their own. Well, if we learned anything from, uh, from <clears throat> how how tough of a how <sighs> high of like a mountain Alden Ehrenreich had to climb in order to feel like like this would be a different situation, but to feel like Harrison Ford's Han Solo, I would want to see someone have to, a little more creative no, freedom. No joke, no joke. To me, these are even bigger shoes to fill. The Wolverine shoes. Uh, so um, I, don't know, I don't know about that. I'm kind of torn. I mean, obviously, most people would say Han Solo's shoes are bigger, but to me, Wolverine. I think it's bigger. a different case. I so, think I think you might have a case for that standpoint if this person who steps into the Wolverine role is trying to bring back a Hugh Jackman's version, which I think would be impossible. So I I, di- I I checked out the wiki entry though, and it says you know he's Canadian, he's deadly, he's brooding. But then these four words stood out, Uh-oh. and the four words are of a small stature. Okay. He was always supposed to be a little guy with a temper. So here's what I'm thinking. Casey Affleck. Casey Affleck would kind of be interesting to me. Uh, Barry Cogan. Oh, wow. Yeah. Like, I see him on Instagram uh, sparring with Jared Abramson, who's, huh. who he's in American Animals with all the time. Barry Cogan is a is a, like a tough Irish guy, uh, you know, t- you t- tougher than one. the soft-spoken guys that he's played, I think. Um, Jake Johnson would oh, kind of be interesting. Okay. I could see him uh, having a, a temper. Chris Abbott 
Is, is uh, Christopher Abbott? Christopher Abbott is another one who is just exceptional in every single thing yeah. that he's in, but he always picks these, you know, super interesting but under the radar projects. So other than girls, I feel like there's never been that kind of wide exposure for him. And, and if you didn't, you know, cast a white guy, I don't think, I don't, I don't necessarily think that Wolverine has to be a white guy or anything. Elon Noel, who's in The oh, Purge. Okay. The, the, uh, like that was, he was kind of badass yeah. in that movie. Um, and then a guy who was already in the X-Men franchise, but just not in in the right role at all uh oscar isaac could you see so, oscar isaac as wolverine exactly when you said those four words mm. my mind immediately went guy. to oscar isaac yeah and he's great too he's i mean i've never seen oscar isaac give a subpar performance even when i don't love the film he's I, in i think you just need to be able to like grow an awesome beard as Wolverine. Wolverine has to be like a her suit. He's got guy. a beard in Inside Lewin Davis. He yeah, can no, he grow I, a beard. I, I think he can. Yeah, yeah. that's sort of what okay. put him in my mind. But so anyways, like that, that, that's like the top that's priority. The I had like tick. 30 <laughs> names, you know, and, and different guys of different statures and things like that. But, you know, if, we're, if I'm focusing on a short list with that of a small stature thing, those are my okay. guys. Okay, I think we have, a, we have a solid combined list here. I'm curious to see if and when this ever happens, though. I hope somebody's <laughs> listening to us at, at Disney. Yeah. Christopher Abbott. Mm. That would be nice all right question number three now is a twitter question from princess kathy who writes why don't movie studios release an r-rated and pg-13 version of movies i personally would watch more movies if they had less swearing in them wouldn't studios make more money by pleasing more moviegoers it's a good think? question yeah actually, i actually think it's a pretty good question uh, i'm not so i'm not sure what the additional cost would be of cutting a PG-13 and an R-rated version of the film. Mm -hmm. But I mean, they have different, they send different cuts of movies to theaters each week, whether it's a 2D version, the 3D version, the 3D IMAX version. So, you know, why can't instead of those format changes, why can't there be rating changes where it's like, hey, come see Deadpool 2 in theater one, mm -hmm. or the PG-13 cut of Deadpool 2 in theater two. Um, I, I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if studios actually started to do this in an effort to cater to greater swaths of, of potential audiences, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, I don't know, it's intriguing. I was trying to look up uh, if there was any sort of MPAA restriction where a movie with one title can't get to rating designations. But I, the only thing that I found about that was, I, and this does not necessarily mean it's fact, but was literally one Reddit comment that said a movie can't, which is the only restriction that I could so imagine there being. You don't think like, because we don't know what the title of this Deadpool, this Deadpool, yeah, yeah. untitled Deadpool See, movie that's coming out of Christmas. This might be a You don't think case. that they could release it as Deadpool 2, the same title as the other one but with a pg-13 see rating. i don't because d don't we don't they keep calling it like this untitled deadpool project i think if it if there's enough you're right. you know uh it creative differences let, i guess let me ask you this what if one was like deadpool 2 the number and then one was deadpool 2 with the roman numeral like is that a different title i have i have you know, no like, clue i don't know what the specifics of their their I mean, rules do, are i should do some research yeah. on that it's a good question but i remember uh do you remember when 50 shades of gray first came out there was i can't remember if it was anything that was ever taken seriously but there was some talk about having you know like an x-rated version like oh. for everybody who really wanted to dive into that element of the source material that they would have two versions out there yeah i don't know, I don't know. I don't know how real that, that ever but was from a financial standpoint this does make sense to me i think uh one of the big things though that would maybe you know put a stop to it is a director who creatively wants right. this version of his or her movie to be out there and to tailor their movie to reap the financial benefits right. might cause a little bit of conflict but you know if we're just talking about box office right now this kind of does make sense especially for someone like princess kathy who is a little sensitive to swearing and doesn't want it and you can do anything you want on own video so that's true yeah i mean we've seen black and white unrated all that kind of stuff all right, want to take us into question four? All right, question four then. Um, comes from Omar Correa. Why don't studios just put out uh, polls on social media to find out what fans and consumers want in their movies before they finalize them? I've heard some studios leak information to the press to see what the reaction is, so this wouldn't be much different. They wouldn't reveal the poll results. You just have to see the movie to see what decisions were made. I think this could help studios like Warner Brothers when making decisions for the next DC film. I'd love to hear your thoughts. 
This is interesting. It sounds really dangerous to me because, you know, my mind immediately goes to a company like CinemaScore. And I know Omar is talking about it as it pertains to developing a property and actually making a movie. But, you know, CinemaScore, they specifically go out and they poll moviegoers who are seeing it opening night. It feels like a, like a contained uh, a contained way to gather information where, you know, you kind of know what you're getting. Whereas when you put something out on Twitter, it's almost like a crapshoot. It's like, who knows who's going to respond to your poll? if they really have any interest in the movie, what their what their motivations are, especially with all, you know, the rumors out there about, and, and it's not even rumors, it doesn't matter what industry you're in, there's certain Twitter uh, profiles out there that are that are fake, they're there to promote something, they're, they're bots or whatever, but in this case, there seems like there's something there, it's just you would need some sort of rules or restrictions to make sure that the data you're collecting and the feedback you're collecting is actually usable, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I don't know. The, the, to me, the idea of opening up uh, creative decisions to the public is, is kind of in, idiotic, uh, just because to me, for every idea you get, you'd get good idea you get, you'd get like three terrible ones. But essentially, don't you wind up in that position eventually anyway when your movie comes out? <laughs> not not necessarily. I mean, there have been plenty of great movies. Like, I just don't get why a, if you were a studio executive and you spent years toiling in the trenches to achieve a semblance of power, yeah, why would you just give it up then to, to social media, which represents such a small sliver mm -hmm. of the audience? Like, we think because we live in this social media bubble that like, you know, Twitter represents everybody. How, what, what, is it, what percentage of the population is on Twitter? 2%? I don't know what the exact number is, but you know, o Omar is also getting at this idea here that, you know, sometimes I, I think it is, it's true that we'll have information regarding a future project drop online so that someone can kind of, you know, gauge the temperature there and figure out how much interest there is in an actual property or someone being cast in a certain role or something like that. So it is kind of the same thing, but when you're, when you're talking about reaching out on social media and getting specific creative ideas, that's when it seems like it's, it's way more risk than it's actually worth. Yeah, I just, I think that you have to, you know, we've been well served for decades, even though there have been plenty of bad movies along the way, by, but we've been well served by allowing creative people to be creative mm -hmm. and not taking major decisions out of their hands. To me, polls are just notoriously unreliable. I mean, you know, do you only get to vote once? Like, you know, how do they keep track of that? Yeah. Uh, because things, I mean, nothing, you can't trust anything these days, whether it's a Rotten Tomatoes score, or an IMDb audience score, or any of that stuff. Um, yeah, and like the other thing is, is the poll advising the creative process or is it deciding the creative process? Because those are two different well, things. Yeah. I can understand, you, you know, putting out polls to sort of help you make a decision, but I don't think it's like, well, the winner of this poll, that's what's in the movie. Like, no, that's crazy. Of course. I yeah. think, if anything, it's more of like an extra thing to put in your back pocket, which, you know, in some senses, it can't hurt, but it's pretty much exactly what you just said is, you know, when you have a specific company that pulls people a certain certain way and gets ver a very specific set of data, that's su that can be super useful. Whereas when you're kind of shouting into the void of Twitter and you, who knows who's responding, who knows how many people are responding more than once, that's when it becomes a little bit dangerous. But you know, this, this question I think is just a sign of the times where, yeah, like it's Twitter and social media is super vocal and it's affecting the industry every single day. So is this kind of inevitable anyway? I mean, I, I suppose you're right, but to me, it just kind of reeks of like entitlement, like the whole thing. And, and it's like, to me, if you want to make decisions, either do it with your wallet as an audience member or come out here and try to get a job in the industry and work your way up to that point. And when you do, send me a fruit basket for the inspiration. <laughs> oh, yeah. But uh, yeah. that's that sadly, I feel like not the truth of the industry anymore. Yeah. Everybody, everybody has a say, everybody wants a say, and, and who knows, you know, sometimes you could have that, that one, you know, super fan out there who really does have a good idea, and maybe, I, actually, you know, you know what this I, makes me think of is um, a, an interview I did with Angie Thomas, who wrote The Hate You Give, mm -hmm. and you know how she got that book published? She uh, tweeted at a book publisher, oh. and she said, listen, I have this book with this idea, is that something you would be interested in, and they made her book, now her book is a movie. 
That's, so I don't that's know. an There's... amazing story. And listen, we're about to, for our next question, yeah. we're about to sort of pl- exactly. put on our studio like, executive hats. I hope somebody's listening to it. Essentially, in a way, we're going to be doing the exact same thing. Yes. All right. Uh, question number five is a Twitter Good question, question from uh, Strange Play UK, who writes, in the spirit of Halloween, which horror franchise would you revive and how would you do it? All right, I have been looking forward to I this know. question. I had a morning. feeling you'd like this one. Uh, so, here's what I would say. Uh, to me, it's like I am terrified of Middle America <laughs> and and a so-called Trump country, for lack of a better term. Okay, like it would you know it just seems like a hotbed of conservatives. Uh, and everyone I talk to about the Midwest, nobody has a lot of great stories about it. Maybe that's just in my limited experience okay. for people who, who have been visiting lately to Iowa, to Kansas, etc. So what a, I think there's something to be done with the children of the corn franchise. There okay? is. Uh, which is which the original was uh, set in Nebraska. I think you could do something political with it. Like, you know, these kids are like mini Trumps and they're just full of hate oh, wow. and they're sl- Yeah, they're killing all, all the adults. Uh, but you know, it's it, there's it's like has a tinge of get out to it, because um, I I it's like I used to call Nikki Fink she who walks behind the rose, and I think it would be great to resurrect he who walks behind the rose because that was always a great villain to me, the the malevolent entity making these kids kill. Ah yes, well. Uh... I'm going to veer away from from politics with this. Well, when I think about the Midwest, too, I think my favorite horror scenario is just the middle of nowhere idea, especially because as someone who's never taken a real road trip before, it's like I always watch things like Texas Chainsaw and I'm like, I kind of want to drive a van cross country Mm -hmm. and not be able to see anything for miles and miles. But you're going to like this one. My mind immediately went to scream because even though I am very precious about the first scream and even the second one to an extent, I think this is an idea and a concept that basically calls for a revitalization where now if you have Scream 5, you've got a whole new crop of horror movies that you can get meta with, and then you can also get meta with the original Scream where somebody else is influenced by the existence of Scream. I mean, it's you know it's kind of like Stab within Scream, and now we're going to have Scream within Scream, but mm-hmm. I really do think that there is good reason and there's good storytelling opportunities to bring back that franchise. I, I just feel like it has, it has never really gone away because of the MTV series. Yeah, like, which it's, it's just it's you know, so what, what's the other one though because i feel like you have another oh yeah one well you saw my other one and you know it too because i don't <laughs> no, stop talking no about brainer. it it's final destination what warner brothers and new line just like have me over i have just a long an epic long list of opening kill sequences yep. that are free I, not to pat myself on the back, but they're genius. You could just go on for days with ideas for Let's Final write Destination. A script. Let's write a script. Because I, I know people in New Line. They, we'll they sell had it, it They had it. They had it with the Dark Ages. Is that not a genius idea when the you have... Dark Ages? Yeah. That's, uh, that's what they were thinking like about period? for Final Destination 6. Go period. Could you imagine? And I think the... Uh, yeah. I can't remember if this was a real teaser or not, but it was like a bunch of people like rowing on a boat. And could you imagine rowing on like an old school boat like that and all of a sudden you have a major disaster nobody wants to what you're crazy you could say you could i think you'd make it super modern and, and like you have kids getting killed on like uh, birds your and limes mind go, your mind goes to that for like every idea like you want you want to modernize christine also yes well no, that's, that gotta, is how things would be done who would you gotta go, have some, nobody some goes period backwards. some texture to it uh well i, I mean really but, one way or the other a final destination movie could be set at any time period, any place with any group of people, and that idea, that core concept, will still have loads of appeal. I'm okay. I could do period, but like, I, I, I guess like seventies. Like, seventies. I or mean, maybe you even World even, War Two. But like, really, how crazy would it be to see that franchise turned on its head, and you have like a like an English like a like costume like a costume drama or something like that. <laughs> it's like like I what guess, what I if. Don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it depends what the budget would be. And I didn't mean to get political with Children of the Corn. And, and again, my experiences in middle America have been lovely. I've been to Montana, to St. Louis, to Nashville. Never had a problem there. But I've been hearing more and more horror stories about people who are going back to visit their families in the Midwest. Oh. And the families are full of Trump supporters and stuff like that. Uh, so I just, I don't know. There's an opportunity there to seize on 
you know, the, the, take the temperature of the yeah. nation via a Stephen an, an, well, you know, an old look, Stephen King story. Look what Get Out did. Look what the Purge is doing now. I mean, there's... I've got one other too, pair because I, uh -oh. Children of the Corn may be unlikely. I don't know what okay. the, what's going on with rights. Uh, short, so short of that, and I know this is something that certain people at Blumhouse would love to do. I don't know if you've seen this movie, The Abominable Dr. Fibes. I've never seen it. It's great. It's an old Vincent Price movie. Huh. Uh, I would try to cast a big star as Dr. Fibes, and I think that could be so awesome. Okay. All right. I'm, yep. I'm sold. That's it. I'm That's sold. It. That's all I got for mailbag I got today. A, I got a book to read from you and now a movie to watch from you. All right. Hope you guys enjoyed this. This is I I did. It was kind of fun, a little <laughs> off the rails. Uh, this was your Sunday edition of Collider Mailbag. As always, do not forget to like and share it. Thank you guys for joining us today, Jeff. Thank you for being here. Enjoy Don't, the rest of your Sunday, Perry. Yeah, <laughs> I, I better enjoy the rest of my Sunday because this week I'm up against Cody and uh, I want to beat the reluctant commish there. Who are you I, playing? I think I'm playing Adam Smith, who's in the booth right now. Uh -oh. Yeah. Adam Smith is He's got a good team. It. He does He's have got a, a good, good team. team. Uh, we'll, we'll keep you updated on all the uh, the fantasy football action on Twitter. I don't know. We'll tell you about it on Movie Talk tomorrow, 4 p.m. PT Live. Go watch it. Hey, everybody. Mark Ellis here. Thanks for watching this episode. You want to watch more? Then click up here. Or you can click right here for more great content from Collider. If you haven't subscribed to Collider Video, do so right now and share this vid with your friends. Thanks for watching.